Great to see you all here today with us um, for our webinar on healthy fasting. Um, today we have with us Rita Madden, and we're so excited to hear from her. Before we get to her, there's a few housekeeping things I want to go over. You, over. Um, those of you that have been with us before are probably familiar with them. Um, just so y'all know, we are recording this and it'll be put up um, for you to watch again, watch with your friends and families and discuss um, about a week from now. So we will email you out the link once it goes once it goes live. We also have an email we'll send to you right after this webinar with a handout um, that Rita has prepared for you with some um, information and such. We also would really love to thank, um, as always, Leadership 100, because if it wasn't for um, their support and the support of faithful stewards um, like you all, um, these things would, these webinars would not be possible. And um, we're really, really grateful to them for that. So one quick thing I want you all to do as we're preparing, if you can move your mouse around and look at the bottom of your screen, you notice that there's a Q&A um, little folder there. There's also a chat one. The Q&A one is um, the one that you wanna, you wanna click on um, if you have a question um, for Rita. She's gonna do a little presentation. We're gonna do questions at the end, but you can send the questions over whenever you want. Um, at any time. So, so go ahead and do that. The chat button is probably better just to send us if you're having some sort of issue um, that you need us to look at and stuff. So with that, I want to tell you a little bit about Rita. Rita is a registered dietitian. Um, she is an author of a wonderful book called Food, Faith, and Fasting. And she also hosts a podcast on Ancient Faith Radio of the same, um, of the same title. So if you get a chance, definitely check those both out because they're both wonderful resources. She is the Nutrition Director for Mediterranean Wellness which is a company that focuses on sensible weight loss and management as well as chronic um, disease management. And so we are just so grateful to have her here. I had the good fortune of hearing her speak a couple years ago, right before the Great Fast. Um, and I thought we've got to get her to come and talk to, to us a little bit more about fasting. So Rita, we're so happy to have you here today. Aww. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Melissa, for organizing this. Um, as you know, whenever I have a chance to, to share what our tradition offers to us, I, I turn into like a puppet and I feel like I have this string and you pull it and I just talk, 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 talk. So I'm excited we're going to take questions at the end. Um, but what I just kind of did was put together a small workshop to kind of share with us what we already know with what our tradition has outlined for us so beautifully. And you know, working in the field of nutrition, it's really interesting because people say to me, okay, Rita, I want you to tell me when to eat, what to eat, how much to eat. And basically I'm like, you know, they're asking for our tradition in terms of how we have this beautiful rhythm of fasting and feasting, fasting and feasting. And we really hear, it's truly hard to properly feast without fasting. Now, I know many of us, we are living these lives that are way too busy. And, you know, especially when we're caring for a family and raising our young and our youth, there could just be so much going on. Things are being thrown at us from every direction. And so when we look at fasting, I feel that St. Basil the Great has a beautiful teaching that I would like to start off with sharing. And he says, on keeping a spiritual fast, there is both the physical and spiritual fast. In the physical fast, the body abstains from food and drink. In the spiritual fast, the faster abstains from evil intentions, words, and deeds. One who truly fasts abstains from anger, rage, malice, and vengeance. One who truly fasts abstains from idle and foul talk, empty rhetoric, slander, condemnation, flattery, lying, and all manner of spiteful talk. In a word, a real faster is one who withdraws from all evil. You know, we hear this teaching from St. Basil the Great, and the food end of it is just mentioned, bloop, and then on we go to all the other stuff. 
we know that the church tradition teaches us that fasting always has three arms. Yes, there's the food and drink component, but then there's prayer and almsgiving. And we can't really do one without the other to attain the spiritual benefits that await us when we come to the feast. One without the other, St. John Chrysostom says, if you're going to slander your brother, might as well eat meat. What have you accomplished? St. Seraphim teaches us that, yes, there is a food component. And he explains to us, the Holy Fathers didn't just jump right into like this intense, full-blown, meager eating. They trained themselves to become satisfied with less food over time. But St. Seraphim again tells us it's not just about the food. So we hear this over and over and over, the teachings of these three arms. So it's good that we should challenge ourselves when we approach a fast. This is absolutely a tool that has been provided by our tradition to help us deepen our life in Christ, our communion with Christ. But it's always important, I feel, that when we start any fast, we focus on some of the teachings of what a correct spirit should look like. St. Mark the Aesthetic explains to us, do not think about or do anything without a spiritual purpose, whereby it is done for God. If you travel without purpose, you shall labor in vain. And so many times when we hear these fasts come up, people, I mean, you know, we all, we all get into this. I find myself being sucked into it. I'm like, now it's time to recorrect my diet and be the healthiest I can ever be, right? I'm going to use this to help manage my blood sugars, lower weight loss, so on and so forth. So instead of putting God first, I've decided I'm putting my physical end first, and then, oh, by the way, I'll pray a bit more. Whereas we know that the foundation of anything is prayer, and we have to put God first in whatever action we're doing for it to be a success. Everything should be done for the glory of God. So what I first wanted to do was make sure that we're all entering this upcoming fast, you know, the, the fast of the Holy Nativity in the right spirit. And that's going to be different for all of us. Under the work with our spiritual father, we're going to see where we can challenge ourselves. But now what I wanted to do is kind of look at the two portions. Let's talk about the food just quickly. And I wanted to kind of do some myth busting when it comes to that end. And then let's talk about how we can really look at making this a spiritual approach that is engaging and inviting, not only for us adults, but for our children. So when we look at the food end of it, some misconceptions that I always hear, and especially when it comes to children, is that children cannot fast. There are going to be too many nutrient deprivations taking place. Now, we see that the tradition definitely gives economia or some, some breaks to women that are pregnant and nursing, the elderly and the young. But there's still fasting that can occur. In fact, I wanted to share this with you. I recent, recently have been doing more research on how many vitamins that do we really need? Because you know, you know as well as I know, there's this vitamin craze, right? Supplements, we can get them at the post office. They're everywhere. And so really, how much nutrition do we need? And through science, they have shown that an average adult, okay, let's just take the average adult, this is how much food they need per day to reach their nutritional needs, to get the vitamin A they need, the protein they need, the vitamin C they need. And again, this is for an adult. So to make this come to life, a half a cup of raw spinach, one cup of brown rice, a half an apple, one carrot, six ounces of yogurt, one ounce of pecans, one mango, and three ounces of salmon. That is it. You know, I read that and I'm like, wow, that's close to, you know, what I sometimes eat at one meal. But really, that's all I need for the whole day. Not to experience any nutritional deficiencies, to make sure my body's being nourished in terms of getting the vitamins and minerals and everything that it needs. And so when we look at that amount, we know that for children, it's even less. So the interesting thing about this is that all these foods that were outlined here can be attained by the foods that are outlined by our prescription when we're supposed to focus on fasting foods, when we're supposed to be limiting the meat and the dairy. 
So right there, we've, we can just simply bust the myth that we're not going to be able to attain all the nutrition we need when we fast, because I get that all the time. People are worried about their protein, their calcium. It can all be attained. The other thing, and this is more specifically to adults, is they feel like if they are really going to be focusing on eating less, their metabolisms are going to slow down. Well, this is some great information for us because it's actually the opposite way around. If one wants to elevate their metabolism, one of the best things that they can do is cut out between meal snacking. There is no scientific evidence to show that we need to be eating these six small meals a day to keep our metabolisms up. But there is science to show that if we go for longer times between meals without snacking, this is good for our metabolism. In fact, in other cultures, you don't see the amount of snacking among children like we do here. Now, a lot of it has to do with the fact that there's just so many more convenience foods, and as a result of so many more convenience foods, they've been marketed that children need to have these snacks, bedtime snack, afternoon snack, morning snack, you know, snack, snack, snack. But there's, there's really no scientific evidence to show that this is the way we should be eating. You know, I always joke around with my, one of my coworkers, and, you know, he says it so well, like, we're not cows. We're not supposed to be out grazing all day long. And if we were supposed to be snacking all day long, we probably should be eating grass because that's what cows were intended to eat when they're eating all day long, right? So that's just kind of a little humor to kind of drive home this point that we don't need to be snacking all the time. And actually, the aspect of feeling physically hungry during a fast is what the Holy Father's we're hoping we could physically feel. Because how they connected it for us was that physical feeling of hunger is a physical reminder to drive us to our true food, our spiritual food, our need and dependence for God, our need to pray more. And so when you feel physically hungry because you're choosing to eat a bit more meagerly, meagerly and maybe challenge yourself with not snacking so much, even if it's snacking on fasting foods, you have created a physical reminder in your body to drive you more towards prayer. So this is the, the actual aspect of this fasting that the, the tradition knew so well. You know, I always say that holistic, it's almost become this buzzword and everyone's talking about, you know, how to holistically care for health. The Holy Fathers outlined this for us because they always emphasize that if you're just focusing on the food end of it, and you're not focusing on the state of your soul, then you've missed it. And this is why fasting always has these three arms. The spiritual end, which is the prayer and fast, I'm sorry, the prayer and almsgiving, and the food that just is that discipline to help us deepen those areas. When we hear holistic in our secular realm right now with health, they're talking about a person's emotional well-being, mental well-being. And the beauty about it is, is that our church tradition has already outlined all this for us. So this leads us into the other end of how we should approach a fast. You know, many times, unfortunately, the fasting gets approached as kind of a, a punishment, right? You know, we have this bent perception of what it should look like. And we start to just, oh, goodness, I'm not going to be able to eat that. Oh, my gosh, how am I so expected to go to all these different services? And we start to spin out on these, you know, we give in to this, this um, negative thinking that this is going to be more of a strain. And I think it's really important, and especially with our children, when we focus on the journey. Everyone loves to take a trip, right? You get excited. You start to pack your bag. You think about what you're going to see and experience. And if we frame it like that for ourselves and for our children, we have totally reshifted what this fast is all about. Every feast day is a, a period of joy where we are called to celebrate. You know, the beautiful thing about the, the, the breaking of the nativity fast is we have 12 days that take us to theophany where we're called to be in celebration. It's funny, so many people think the 12 days of Christmas are the 12 days leading up to Christmas, but we know in our tradition that it's the 12 days after that we're called to be in celebration. It's way more than just this one day. To properly feast, we must properly fast. Let's set ourselves up for the journey and set our children up for the journey by first framing things and explaining the why. You know, when um, managers and supervisors are going through training. 
leadership training, the first thing they are encouraged to do is to explain to their employees when there's a change occurring, why the change is occurring. We need to know the why. What is the first um, frame of a form of questions that children learn to ask? Why, 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 right? We always need to know the why. When people become orthodox, um, you know, I remember when my husband was, you know, seeking the faith and he was starting to understand more and more about the disciplines. And then one day he walked into a church and there was full blown prostrations taking place. And he was like, whoa, I've never seen this before. Why are you doing this? He went to the, the spiritual father of the community and simply just asked that. And when he got the answer to why we do prostrations, everything clicked. You know, fasting can be a challenge for adults. Think of it about how much more it is for children with seeing that they're attending church more often, seeing that the way they're currently eating has changed a bit, but not understanding why. Starting off the fast with framing how we have this joyful and exciting end that we are going to attain, that the, the end of the journey and setting it up like this is beautiful. You know, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ that use the, the advent calendars with all the little squares that open, you know, and every day there's a story that lead us to the final end of the Holy Nativity is a wonderful way to get children engaged. So I encourage you as families and, you know, even just, you know, um, if, uh, you know, you're just an adult and you don't have children in your life and you're trying to create a sense of this journey, create little milestones to get to the feast. We know we celebrate St. Nicholas Day during the fasting period. Make that a milestone that is really celebrated. Form a tradition in your own family to make that a special thing. When you're going to have extra services and you're going to be attending those extra services, share with your children what this is all about. How when we fast, we are trying to decrease some form of entertainment in our life to open ourselves up to the life of Christ more, to be in prayer more. And we're so thankful that we have these services to help us do that because sometimes we say we're going to pray more in our own homes, right? But all of a sudden we look and we're like, oh, maybe we should decorate. Oh, maybe we should vacuum. Oh, maybe we should clean. When we're at a church, and we're surrounded by the holy icons and we smell the burning of the incense and we hear the chanting and our senses are engaged and we're with our community. It makes it more conducive for us to come together as a family in Christ and pray. The church tradition knows that we need these disciplines and that's why we're giving these opportunities. Another thing that you can do to bring more joy to this and create some milestones is create a time where you're going to alms give together. And what would that look like for you? Maybe with another family, you choose to do some volunteering. And this is a date that you're going to look forward to, to do this together. When we're creating the fasting periods to be more of a journey with specific milestones that we are going to hit to do things to deepen this aspect of the spiritual journey, it changes it. It no longer is viewed as a punishment or a torture, but a shift in our year where our liturgical calendar allows us to properly get into the fasting so that we can celebrate the feast with glorifying God in this way that we journeyed to the foot of the manger you were laying in. We make that journey happen in our own life by setting specific milestones throughout our day. When this, um, um, session is ended. There is just um, a resource guide I put together that highlights some different ideas that you can do together as a family, as a community, to make these milestones richer. I just, you know, just shared a couple. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to think about how we can make this come together. Uh, a lovely one that I think really ties the, the children into it so well is picking a day that you, you make cards and maybe cook a meal for a shut-in and deliver it together. This is the family and the children seeing this act of, act of almsgiving put into practice. We know that almsgiving can also come in, in the form of you know, making greater donations at these times of year, but we also know that it's a giving of our time. 
And many times during the fast, I think it's important for children maybe they're not going to be fasting so as strictly, you know, maybe they're going to have a little bit of, of dairy or, or whatever you choose to um, discuss with your spiritual father on what that needs to look like for your family personally. But there could be the aspect of discussing, okay, what form of entertainment can we decrease a little bit, all of us, adults, children, all of us alike, so that we can open up some time to make these cards for people that are shut-ins or to pray together as a family, to have a book that is going to be our Lent book. And every day after dinner, can we even just take three minutes and just read a little bit out of it? That book becomes part of the journey. So instead of taking, you know, a half hour out of af after dinner, maybe we don't have that time. But if we take a book and make that book, just snippets of that reading be part of the journey, it gets tied in to the whole spiritual end and component of the fast. So to kind of sum this up, and then we want to um, open this up to questions. We want to recognize that when we're framing a fast, not only for ourselves, but for our children, we want to make sure that we have the correct spirit, that we're looking at this not as another thing just to benefit our physical health, but to tend to the gardens of our souls. And oh, by the way, X, Y, and Z just naturally came into more check with our health. You know, a lot of times when I'm talking to people about the fasting periods, they, they notice that just because they've chosen to decrease their worldly entertainment, whether it be not checking Facebook so much or not watching television shows so much, they notice that they feel their stress level has gone down, right? But they didn't set the intention of doing that. They set the intention of decreasing their worldly entertainment to be able to spend more time in maybe silent prayer. And then just, oh, by the way, this happened. So whenever our intention is putting God first, God works, things just happen. You know, it's this mystical thing that we cannot even wrap our heads around starting to explain that happens when we choose to practice the traditions of our church. So I encourage you to challenge yourself, see where you were as a family and personally in your last fast. And what can you do under the guidance of your spiritual father to challenge your, yourself a little bit in this fast? Look at both the food component, but do not let that be the guiding force. Try to focus on what you can do to discipline yourself more with deepening our life in the prayer and almsgiving aspects. And put this all together by framing entering your fast as beginning a journey. And look at what that journey would look like for you. Create those milestones when you celebrate. Create those milestones when it's going to be a more intense time. Maybe you're attending a longer service. Maybe you're getting ready to focus specifically on a form of almsgiving and there's some preparation in that. And always, always, always explain to children the why. This is really making their faith and these practices of the discipline come to life together. Our faith is not the practices of the discipline. These practices of the discipline are just tools to deepen our faith. And so for them to understand what the faith is all about and that we have these tools to make it come more to life, not only deepens it for children, but for adults alike. So I hope this was, God willing, somewhat helpful. And now um, I guess we could go ahead and take some questions. Thank you, yes. If anybody has any questions, um, you know, again, go to the Q&A send them over. Um, we don't know how many we'll get to. We'll try to get to as many as we can. And um, this was really wonderful to hear. And I want to emphasize one of those points that you said. You said, you know, consider these things and then go and talk with your spiritual father, you know, because that's the important thing is that we all need to talk with our spiritual fathers to figure out what is the best way for us to be fasting. We're presenting, you know, some things here for you to consider as you prepare with the Christmas fast coming up and starting on the 15th and um for old calendar the uh, what's the math what uh, the, oh that was it 13 days 13 days I, later I, I I think. Numbers, so, so, so anyway um but but so you know i think these are just things to get you thinking so that you can discuss as a family and with your spiritual father is what is the best now and i'm, I'm reminded of a story um my husband and i were doing a retreat before the great fast and we, we had the little kids and we were talking with them about what is Lent. 
And all these kids went around the room and it was so amazing to me because all of them, all they were talking about was food. We can't eat meat. You know, we don't do this. And, you know, it was all about food and stuff. And this one little boy, it, God bless him, he stood up and he said, can we stop talking about this? And he actually started to cry because all this talk about food is making us not talk about God. And I think that's more important. And it was, it was such a striking moment for us to realize how much, you know, we focus on the food and bringing all those other aspects in are important. But, but to back up just a little bit, because I feel like I, I do the opposite sometimes. Like I, you know, we try to integrate the almsgiving, the prayer that we do all that discussion with our son, but I'm not really sure how to talk to him about changing his food. Our, our son's nine years, nine years old. We might, we've just started talking with him about that and stuff. How do we introduce the idea of the food portion of the fast in a way that's healthy for our children um, and integrated into all the other things? Yeah, that is a, that's a wonderful point, actually, because, you know, as an adult, when you sit and read when, why the Holy Fathers decided on the different foods that were going to be allowed in the fast and not allowed in the fast, it's very actually interesting. You know, um, in the ancient tradition, they felt that meat actually excited the body, right? And what's very interesting about this is when we look at modern day science, you know, there is this big discussion that eating too much meat is very hard on the body, very taxing on the body. And so, you know, when I hear excited, I think it causes inflammation, you know, and so if we could kind of subdue things that ignite our passions, which the Holy Fathers thought eating a lot of meat did do, um, this could be very detrimental to us trying to be more in a prayerful state. You know, the other end about it is that we're choosing foods that are more humble. And where we see such an abundance of meat these days, this was really, you know, um, uh, not something so common that could just be e eaten in such large amounts. So it was considered a, a food of luxury and should be used more, again, to celebrate feasts versus something that, you know, one that was trying to kind of put Christ first, wouldn't, you know, put so many different foods on the table. In fact, that's what another point that St. John Chrysostom you know, makes, you know, we have all these luxuries and we need to kind of decrease them in all areas of life. Whereas, you know, in our culture now, this is where the shopping buzz takes place. I think something that's very helpful when we're talking to children about the food is kind of breaking it down to this simple aspect of we are trying to focus on taking time, um, taking like reshifting of our time. We're trying to spend less time focusing on what we're going to eat and less time in the kitchen so that we have more time for prayer. We're trying to eat a diet that is going to be a little bit more meager, you know, and for children, you know, to kind of, for them to hear I'm hungry and for them to kind of equate it to, well, that is supposed to be a physical reminder for us to pray more might be a, a bit large, but for them to understand that you're not having milk with your cereal today. And because you're not having milk in your cereal, that actually is supposed to be a reminder to pray could be something that resonates with them more. Mm -hmm. you're not seeing meat at a typical meal that you'd see it. That's a reminder for you to pray. And if you make that reminder correlation for them, I think that really works. Wow. That's good. That's really nice. Um, another qu a question came in about, is, is there a general age um, that you think it's appropriate to start fasting for children or start discussing it with them? Okay. So again, I would say that this is something that I would first recommend you talk with your spiritual father about, um, because again, I feel like those rec kind of recommendations need to come from there. From a nutritional standpoint, I could speak to that. Mm -hmm. And again, when we look at, you know, I, I, I don't know if you guys found that as exciting as I did with the amount of food we need and the different groups we need to get all the vitamins and minerals we need. But again, everyone's going to be taken care of with just that. You know, your vitamin B12 is not going to go low. Your iron's not going to go low. Your calcium is going to be okay. So that you could see at any age. Children are able to really eat a fasting diet, um, you know, as soon as they start eating solid foods, as long as they're eating a variety of those foods. So there's not necessarily a specific age. And when, again, you look at other cultures around the world, a lot of times this is just their traditional diet, you know? So I think we in this culture talk so much about vitamins and minerals and this and that, that many times if we just look at the different foods that are presented, 
that's going to be balance in itself from traditional ways of eating. I always look at a traditional food in my culture, hummus, right? It naturally has lemon juice in it. And the lemon juice helps you absorb the vitamins out, the iron out of the beans. And it's just a traditional way of eating food. We weren't trying to think, oh, I got to put that lemon juice in there to get that, you know, iron out of there. So I would say, you know, in terms of talking about the fasting principles, our tradition has always taught us that there are these physical things that we experience that can be used as teachers for the spiritual end. We don't necessarily separate the two. And so if we start to talk to children about we are physically not having meat, but that physical aspect of removing meat from the plate for a period of time is supposed to remind us to pray, I think can be talked about whenever, you know, they have an understanding of starting to connect these physical aspects to, to, their, to their faith. You know, it's the same thing of when we show them an icon in the church and we start to explain why icons are there, you know, this physical, you know, um, picture that we see and we're trying to convey to them, you know, these windows into heaven can take place at the, at the, at the plate with food. Wow. Okay, wonderful. And we've had a couple of comments that have come in. Just some, somebody said that her spiritual father said around the age of four, nutritionally and spiritually is a good age. But again, each, each child, each family is different. But he said something about the age of reason and what kids can understand a little bit better than, but again, that difference different, might differ um, from, from person to person, but that's interesting to hear. Um, you know, here's an interesting thing. What, what if you have children that really don't want to fast along with the family? And that could go for younger children or older children. Um, how would you, how, what's the best way to deal with that? Okay. So again, talking to your spiritual father, you take all those hard questions to them. It gives us the, <laughs> um, you know, um, best way to, to kind of work through things. But I think that also too, uh, so here's something very interesting. When I work with families, They'll say, my, oh, my kid wants to eat junk, is it junk food. And, you know, my first answer to them, and we do it in a lighthearted way, I'm like, well, so are they getting in the car, driving to the store and bringing the junk food home themselves? And, you know, it makes a light bulb go off, right? Because the parents are always the gatekeeper. And so whatever foods get brought into the house are determined by the parent. And so, you know, I think that's why we want to kind of re- I wouldn't, I don't want to say reframe because you're probably doing this in your own home already, but how we frame things make all the difference. If the, the parents are embracing the fast, you know, and they're looking at it as this exciting time, this fruitful time that we have carved out of our year to deepen our life in Christ, but there's jo this joyous thing at the end, how things are framed make it so much more inviting. And I think that's important because, you know, Parents learn from their children. So they're going, to, they're going to see what their children are doing and they're going to follow suit. Um, you know, I think when children get to a certain age, you know, there could be a little bit more difficulty in the home. And again, that's where, again, having different things that we have that are supporting our faith all the time, you know, having the children involved with um, children their age and having events where they're almsgiving together. There was a, a Sunday school teacher. She did a really powerful thing. Um, she would take her teenage um, Sunday school class um, during a fasting period, and this might seem jarring to some of us, but she would take them um, to the streets of, I think she was living in Syracuse at the time, and she would have them sleep on the concrete for a night. And, you know, it was safe and everything, but just to make these children experience what it was like to be homeless. And then as a group, they went and they, they served food, they prepared food for, for the hungry. Now, that I think could be a bit different, but the children were involved because they, were connect, they had a connection with their friends and that was their sense of community and they did this together. I think if um, children have you know, their, their friends that are going to Sunday school with them and they're all fasting together and the Sunday school teacher is kind of directing this and they see the community doing this, they're more likely to do it. If you're having that struggle, I think that, you know, there's a lot of things that might be going on that, again, if discussed with the spiritual father can bring it more into balance. But again, sometimes children might not want to do it just because they don't understand why it's taking place. And it is viewed more as a frustration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. it was a long, that was kind of long. 
No, so. that was a that was a great answer. And actually, somebody here wanted to know if they could get a copy of the list of what foods we need for one day's nutrition, which that you shared at the beginning. Um, and stuff the vitamins. If we could get that typed up, maybe that can go in the email we send out to them. Um, Absolutely. But you know, it was interesting when you read that. I remember watching a show uh, a while back. I can't remember. It was some documentary, and it just showed how. Um, the the calorie to nutrition ratios um in america like we eat so many calories but the nutrition value is very low whereas you go to like some other countries where their nutrition is really high and their calories are much lower and stuff and it looked like the things you you know listed are very nutrient dense and i i think that's part of the things you know our normal diet that we eat unfortunately in america is probably not going to sustain us through Lent. It actually barely probably sustains us in, in, without Lent. So I don't know. Could you comment a little more about that? Yeah, and, you know, I'll gladly send that out. The resource is a, it's a new documentary called Vitamania, where I told, took that an, a, amount from, but you see it replicated in, in other forms of food. Um, but, you know, I, I think that you brought up a really good point because what's the buzz diet now? Intermittent fasting, 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 right? I, I, I love this because you know, with my work, I'm like, this isn't something new. This is something that, you know, specifically many traditions, but you know, the, our tradition has been doing forever. Now the science has just caught up to it versus we're inventing a diet. And now what's the science behind it, right? So that's just so beautiful to see that in some sort of way, we're having some science, you know, like God in his wisdom did this, you know, this tradition created this, we have this. And now the science is saying, wow, you know, this is such a healthy way to eat. And I kind of feel like when we look at just when we're only focused on the nutrition end of things, you know, St. Paisios so wonderfully says, if you really want to help your patients, tell them about the true meaning of life. You know, it's just, it's not the medicine. It's just not the food. If you don't have all these components, there's always going to be something missing. Mm -hmm. And that is something that, you know, it really does. It weighs heavy on my heart because I see it with my secular work of people just trying to focus so much on the nutrition end of things, but something still always feels like it's missing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, you know, I'll gladly, you know, send out this list. And um, I think I wanted to kind of emphasize it to say that, you know, we really don't need a lot of food. We need our spiritual food. And when we look at fasting, um, you know, uh, Melissa, you brought up a good point where, you know, someone asked like, well, maybe the children don't want to do it. But again, really a lot of times, it might be that the adults need to challenge themselves a bit more with it. Um, I have a dear, dear friend that, you know, she said, yeah, for years, we, we used our children as our excuses. Like, oh, we can't fast. We have children and it's too hard to cook for them and cook for us. And then they did the great fast one year with their children, attended more services, you know, prayed as a family more, ate fasting foods. And they just said their, their Paschal experience was so different you know, where it might have just felt like attending another service, the journey leading up to that end was just so different. And so again, it's a different, it's going to be different for all of us, like you said, and our spiritual father knows best what um, would be the route to direct us. Wonderful. Um, we had another um, question that came in. We had a few questions that come in. I've noticed that shopping during the fasting periods is a lot more expensive than for the rest of the year. I find this ironic, and I was wondering if you could give some guidelines on keeping the cost down for the fast. That money could be used for almsgiving, for instance. Yes. Okay. Good question. So, um, you know, that would that would be kind of interesting to to look at because um, I believe if you visit my uh, website, um, it's it's going to be on the handout or um, maybe the email. But I have some menus, some example menus. But again. Um, when we look at meats, wine, you know, dairy, th these foods really have a high ticket price. So um, it might be just kind of tweaking it a bit because a lot of times what happens is I think that when people are trying to fast and it's not their normal way of eating, right? I mean, a lot of times when I'm doing workshops, I'll have a lot of um, people that have become orthodox. And so fasting is so different than what they're traditionally used to eating. But we just show them basic small ways to kind of make small changes. And what I'm trying to say is that they make the foods from scratch. 
So if you're buying a lot of these prepackaged foods, prepackaged vegan foods, you could see the cost going up. If you're having shellfish every day, you can kind of see the you know cost going up. For me, crab legs are one of my favorite things on the planet, so it's kind of hard to fast and be like, you know, I saved those to break the fast with. But if I was choosing to do that as my form of shellfish, I could see the cost going up. But if you look at lots of the fasting foods, they're they're really humble, you know, foods that are can be very cheap to prepare. Beans, whole grains, you know, using something like. Um, bulgur wheat or you know uh you know whole wheat bread and you know you're you're using these types of foods brown rice i, I tell people one of the easiest fasting meals brown rice some sauteed vegetables and you know you could just switch up the sauce on it that's very nutritious and the cost is kept low um if you're taking something like some kidney beans mixing them with some garbanzo beans chopping up chopping up some red onion drizzling it with a little balsamic vinegar and maybe a little bit of oil um, throwing in some uh, red onion boom you can have that with, you know, a, a nice piece of bread or, um, you know, with a, a, a sweet potato, dinner's ready. Sweet potatoes, they're one of the healthiest foods on the planet and they keep for a long time. And now with Thanksgiving right around the corner, you're going to see them popping up everywhere for a really good price. So there are ways to kind of keep the cost of fasting down. And, you know, I wish we just had more time to kind of like emphasize what some of those meals would look like. Um, but if you at least visit the website, I think I have some fasting meals outlined. Um, and if not, I'll make, I'll make sure to get that guide up there. I use it at the workshops that I do um, to kind of show people how to do this in a cost-effective way. Right. Um, okay, here comes the stump the nutritionist question. How, how do I get more protein if I can't have beans, soy, corn products, or peanuts and peanut butter? Are protein powder additives okay? Okay, so... So again, this is a whole workshop in itself, but um, you know, we always want to look at the ingredients in your foods. So if the protein powder is made up of all real ingredients, um, there's a podcast on this that might be easier to kind of listen to kind of, uh, you know, get this information in a short amount of time. But um, as long as it's made up of clean ingredients, you know, the ingredients that make it up come from God's creation, then that would absolutely be fine. But again, you know, this is something you might need to talk to your spiritual father about because first of all, shellfish might be something that you might need to lean more towards than not. Whole grains have a lot of um, uh, protein in them. Um, and a lot of vegetables do too, which I think we kind of like, you know, don't necessarily think that, but there is a lot of, you know, protein that can be, it, it adds up and we don't need a ton of protein. That's another thing too. Um, but again, this is something you might want to talk to your spiritual father about if you might need a little bit of economia. And I think a lot of times when we have to follow a specific diet because of a health concern, we feel like we're, we're cheating on the fast. We're not, you know, it's, it's not going to be as challenging or, or something for us, but you know, God knows what we need and God has given you what you need. But I always tell people, if you get, you know, um, a blessing from your father to have to fast a different way, then you should be doing that in the healthiest way possible. I always tell pregnant women this. I'm like, okay, you got the blessing, you know, that you can have dairy, but that doesn't mean you can just sit and eat a piece of chocolate cake after every meal and be like, hey, I got a blessing for this, right? It's like every food that you, you, you look at fasting in a completely different way. So even if you're allergic to something, I always like to say that no matter what we are dealing with, all of us can fast in our own way. It has to be done with the work of our spiritual father being the guide, but Fasting, again, it's just not about the specific foods. There's no magic in the foods per se, but there's magic in the, dis no, I shouldn't say magic, but there's, um, there's mysticism, you know, there's this mystical way that God's works in the disciplines. Mm -hmm. um, okay, you know, you mentioned the podcast. After we get off of this, we'll make sure that we can get that link into the resources we send out to you all. So that um, the person that has that issue can look at it a little, little closer. I know that people do have a lot of food sensitivities these days that, um, that can be problematic. Um, in this question, she said, you may have just answered this kind of the focusing on prayer, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it anyway. Um, my daughter's having a tough time fasting while at college. She's very small school with very few choices. She's also trying to eat healthy, and that is making it even more difficult for her. Um, ideas. Okay. So again, you know, again, always with your spiritual father first, but there's a couple different things that just pop into my head real quickly. One, 
she could probably talk to the, the food service director and you know everyone's able to kind of get certain meals made for certain reasons and you know just having i would just probably simplify it for them and say can i have more vegan options so they might be able to accommodate if that's not possible because it is a smaller school and the, the resources are limited you know i would say during the fasting period trying to discipline herself a bit more with maybe foods that feel like treat foods for her she saves for when you're celebrating the St. Nicholas Day, or you know, more of like a feast day, and trying mostly to focus on meager eating. So where we could all benefit from eating healthier, you know, quality foods. Something that is also another approach is during the fast, it's not necessarily so much about the foods, but trying to eat less. And so that could simply be trying not to snack between meals. You know, in college, it that's an easy thing to do. You go to class, you take your snack with you, but maybe just trying to say, okay, I'm just going to discipline myself to not um, eating between meals, but only at meals. That could be a form of fasting in itself. And again, depending on where a person's at and how they've been fasting for so long, the way they discipline themselves more is, is going to vary. But that's, that's just a suggestion, maybe talking to the food service director. Um, and I know a lot of times, and I don't know about her school, but you know, there, if there are salad bars, you know, that have beans featured on them and, you know, maybe a grain salad, these might be, you know, better alternatives. Um, but I know personally, when I talked to my food service director, it was also a smaller school that they did work with having some um, options available. So that was good. And, you know, I mean, now, now being vegan and vegetarian, they're like buzzwords, right? So people are used to hearing this kind of stuff and are kind of almost prepared to make accommodations. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you. Now, this is an interesting question, and it's something I think um, that some people might be wondering about. Um, when we're talking about nutrition and considering the fast, the question is, what what kind of training do our spiritual elders or spiritual fathers have to guide us in our nutritional needs? Oh. And how do we find, you know? Yeah, that's, you know, that's a really, that's a really great, that's a really great point. I, the first thing I would say is that we are called to trust the tradition, right? And if we're eating the foods that have been prescribed to us and we're just sticking to those foods, we are assured that we can get all the nutrition that we need. There are so many resources out there now that we can seek out on our own to what that balance would look like. Um, but again, you know, I always want to try to support, um, you know, spiritual fathers or anyone for that matter in that area, um, having the, the aspect to study this because um, a lot of times like, you're right, you know, I study this stuff and I still get confused. So it can be overwhelming, but I would say it depends on really kind of what the question is. But if you have some spirit, um, specific needs because you're trying to manage a medical condition, you know, the spiritual father, I'm, I'm guessing, will, will give you the, um, you know, spiritual end of it, but we refer you to maybe seeing a personal dietitian. I've seen that many times that spiritual fathers do that. Someone might be, um, you know, dealing with something specific. They give them the spiritual component and they focus on the spiritual discipline of it all, but say, you know, you need to work with a dietitian to get X, Y, and Z. But, um, you know, I've had, thank God, um, it, it's a very humbling thing, but to just have priests ask specific questions, you know, and just, just share that information because even themselves, they're trying to, to practice fasting in a more um, healthy way. You know, when we're care there's nothing wrong with caring for health when we're doing it for the glory of God. When we're trying to take care of our physical health through exercise, stress management, and eating well, you know, to sign up to be a better servant for God, you know, to be more faithful to do his will, this is a good thing. And so, you know, spiritual fathers have told me personally, I have to work on my own health. You know, it's hard for me to tell other people to do it when I need to do it myself. So um, everyone's trying to, to figure out what is best. Mm -hmm. But you might need, even need to ask, you know, for that yeah. blessing to talk to someone. And I think that uh, discerning, you know, spiritual fathers wise that are that are guiding you and stuff guide guide you prayerfully um and and want to know where you are with things just like you would go to a doctor and you need to tell him all your symptoms to get guidance with your spiritual father you kind of need to let him know where you are with everything in your life so he can guide you properly in the fast 
both nutritionally, if you have special needs nutritionally, but also spiritually with all those other needs as well. And if you do have those special, you know, nutritional needs, um, hopefully he will, you know, just reach out um, to someone that can help guide you a little bit more and stuff. Um, because there isn't a class at seminary on nutrition. Yeah. <laughs> you know, actually, that's a very good point, too, because a lot of times, you know, they might recognize that it's not a food thing. You know, it might be more beneficial for you to to work through some anger issues, you know what I mean? They might, but like, again, like you said, it's a discerning process. They, they pray about it. They have been, you know, they s celebrating the sacraments, you know, um, God is, is working with them to help you. And I think um, just one more thing to add to that is that, you know, when we um, talk with a spiritual father too, you know, I think it's very helpful. This is the, for me, when you see the Holy Sacrament of Confession really coming to life is like, why are we doing the things we're doing? You know, like that if, if God's not first, you know, like maybe that's going to come out too. And then the spiritual father just helps redirect everything because they do see that end of it too, is that this just becomes another diet, you know, versus the other ends of it. I've seen spiritual fathers that have told their um, the people not to fast with the food end of it because it's being used as a, a tool incorrectly for them per, uh, per, uh, you know, um, personally. The other thing that I've also seen too is that um, when someone becomes Orthodox, you know, the spiritual father is very good on not having them go full blown into the fast anyways. And they start them off slowly, like, okay, this fast, just try to focus on no meat on Wednesdays and Fridays. And that's enough for a person that is, you know, coming to the faith. Because if, you know, we hear the Holy Fathers tell us, St. Um, Isaac the Syrian really says, if you do too much too fast, you're going to fall, right? And even in my secular work, this is how we help people make healthy behavior changes. You don't want to do too much at once, you're going to fall. You know, there's a Japanese philosophy that says the same thing. We can only do small steps. And as we continue to go through these journeys, we're guided through the, you know, the prayers of our spiritual father of where we should be next with it. Thank you. This has been really wonderful. Are there any other questions? out there um i don't i don't see any i think we got through quite a few of them and um i think what we're going to do is just say thank you so much for this wonderful offering um as i said we will put this up on the web and what we really hope with these webinars is that you can take them to your parishes and you can um dialogue watch them together with people um that you can um continue to to um to kind of support one another in these things. So our, our, our hope is that these webinars, you'll give them feet and take them to your parishes or sit down with your community and, and discuss it a little more in your homes and how to, um, to, to, to approach the fast together as a family, as a parish family. Um, we've had a few more questions about gluten-free, bean-free, soy-free, orthodox fasting recipes and resources for them. Maybe we can um, brainstorm and, and come up with some lists of some, some resources for that. I know we have a few people that might know a few things about that. So we'll try to send that out, if not in the resource today, um, before we send out the webinar um, um, recording next week. So thank you very much with that. Um, also, I, I want to thank Leadership 100 again for their support. Thank um, Rita for being here with us. Next month, I believe our webinar is going to be on the 27th of November. I can't remember the time, but we will be sending that out um, shortly. If you haven't signed up for our listserv at family.gorch.org, it'll keep you informed of all of our webinars. Um, and like us on Facebook, because then you'll see when the different webinars come out and all our other dis different resources we have through our office. But our webinar next month is going to be on mental health issues, which is a, a great topic. We're going to have Dr. Georgette Constantino and Father Jerry Hall with us here to discuss those issues. Um, and we look forward to seeing with you then, um, seeing you then. So thank you all very much. And um, we will see you short next month. Okay. Thank, thank you. you.